Well, great to be here. Um, my name is Mark Neider, and uh, I think I don't have to say much more other than I'm going to get started. Uh, a bit more where I'm from, so my accent isn't originally English, it's actually from Germany. I come from this place, and if you want to look up my hometown, Bielefeld, uh, where I did also my PhD, uh, you will find that there's a lot of claims that it doesn't exist. This is one of the first memes of the internet, uh, probably one of the first memes whatsoever. I think it's from 1991, where people put this meme out that this place doesn't exist, and they, whoever they is, just want us to believe it exists. So we go back, a long history, and I encourage everybody to look this up. Um, now, after the... Uh, a while in Birmingham where I met Jon and many other important people that actually were quite important for my further career. Um, I'm now uh, in Lincoln, and that is the, the whole of the robotics group in Lincoln, the Center for Autonomous Systems, uh, at our away day. I think it was two years ago, so it may, you know, some faces may have changed by now. Um, to give you a bit, quick run through what we do, uh, lots of different academics, only the academics are listed here on the, on the, rest hand, on the right hand side. Um, working in many, many different application domains, tackling robotics, we call that the horizontals. These are the research areas that we are interested in, um, be it uh, robot perception, robot machine learning, mobile robotics, which is something that I'm particularly keen on, and AI, um, and human-robot interaction, as a sort of, well, we try to cluster ourselves, and uh, then we've got many, many different domains of which agri food is currently probably the biggest. So I think... I'm going to start talking a little bit about agri robotics today. I'm going to do a bit more of that also tomorrow. Um, and we are what is called a cross-college entity. That means we've got people in computer science, in engineering, in this Institute for Agri-Food Technology, and also in this doctoral school, if you want, that is focused on um, agri-food robotics. Right, so, so far on this, what I try to do is to get a little bit to know about you, because I found it really difficult. When I signed up to this, I wasn't quite sure what I was signing up to, because normally I do these summer schools for people that have a good understanding of robotics. So if I could convince you to go to this URL or scan the QR code and do this little bit of a survey for me while I carry on speaking, because I want to, to some extent, be reactive to what you want to do, responsive to what you want to do. So today, my plan was to talk a little bit more about general aspects of robotics, uh, robotic architectures, we talked about integration and how you could put things together. I'm going to show you one quite dated examples from the time in Birmingham to in explain some of the fundamentals. And um, we're going to touch on some of the challenges uh, that robotics, particular mobile robots, face these days. And then tomorrow I'm going to pick up a number of other examples, in particular on what I call robots in the wild, that means not necessarily the jungle, not the forest. It means the not so well-defined spaces that they operate in. So not the factory floors necessarily. Right? And probably also not so much roads, even though you could consider these, those being the wild as well. I'm also looking very much into human inhabited spaces. But we can talk a little bit about autonomous driving as well. I know there's people interested. That's what I already gathered from talking to some of you. So... Um, yeah, please do. I see that some people have started this, so I'm not going to go too much into this at the moment. You may carry on in filling out the survey, and then I'll come back to that in a second. This is the sort of my long-term slide that I always put on. This is my mock-up from many, many years ago, that eventually we want to have a robot that is competent, that can do things, like make me a cup of tea, I prefer coffee, uh, that can adapt, so they come with some innate knowledge. They may know something about the world, how we humans operate, wherever this common knowledge comes from. And, and they adapt to the respective situations, and what I'm particularly keen on is have robots that actually are reliable. I don't just work for 10 minutes, but actually we can have them run for a long period of time, and they work autonomously in a variety of probably changing environments, changing situations. And robotics is a vast field, very cross-disciplinary with lots of different things, and over the years, and I keep telling everybody who wants to know, I'm broad but shallow. That means basically I know a little bit of everything, but I'm not one of those people who is a specific expert in one dedicated area necessarily. That probably comes from my role that I started off being the system integrator, right? I had to learn a bit about cloud computing because we did some cloud robotics. I had to learn a bit about interaction design because we did projects with elderly people in care homes. 
Um, we have now, I'm going to probably make some reference to that, like a little bit of Internet of Things devices that are linked in with robotics. Human-robot interaction is a key part that is really important, so I need to have some understanding of um, social sciences from that, et cetera, et cetera. So it comes from very many different areas, and that was also reflected in the kind of size of the group and also the composition of the group that we've got people that are then the experts in these specific sub-areas, and they come together and build, hopefully, cool robotic systems. Um, and then there's like the, the really kind of outfield things that a particular come from now through that we are interested in Aqui robotics. Uh, I've learned a great deal of how many silty clay soils there are in different parts of the country. And it is all interesting to have these links there because what we do in robotics quite regularly is sensing the world, mapping the world, and then basically making decisions, inf inference in these worlds, right? And this is all for this is all data sources for us, right? The soil scientists, they give us some data. The crop scientists give us some data. These are interesting domains to deploy sensors into, etc. Good. So that's what I'm particularly keen on. Um, what we're trying to achieve today and tomorrow, a little bit about the structure and challenges of autonomous um, robots in general. Um, I will not talk about hardware because I have hardly any clue about this. So people that do bio-inspired hardware design, control, etc. Um, this is not where I have an expertise in. I focus on software and putting bits together, let's call it. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about goal-directed behavior. So that is closely linked to planning. So we're going to have a bit of a look into planning in robotics and the particular challenges around that and the uncertainty that comes with that. Um, talk a bit about the development of robotic systems and mapping the world. As I said, mapping is one of the key bits that robots usually do, um, be it in autonomous driving, be it in agriculture, be it indoors, wherever. And then I particularly will focus on the sort of dynamic environments and uh, what robots, what challenges robots and opportunities ro um, humans play for robots and how we can tackle those. That's going to be a bit more technical with some links to papers. Um, I try to collate most bits that I will talk about uh, on this um, website, and I'm sure we will link this also later on into, onto the, the main summer school website, etc. And if there's anything else that comes along, I'll probably put it there. Good. All right. So this is what you have told me. Uh, so we've got the uh, biggest chunk of AI people here. Very good. Should have probably said machine learning as well, because interestingly, I think most people these days equate AI and machine learning. I'm too old to do so, so I still have some sense of good old-fashioned AI, uh, GoFi as we call it. So I'll talk a little bit about that, but then there's also quite a few bits of machine learning and robotics that we're going to talk about a bit. Um, not going to ask who is the others. I will hopefully find out in the coming days. Um, yeah, that's also the sort of general distribution I was uh, expecting. So very good. So hopefully there's a little bit in there for everybody, but it's good. I have a understanding so more than half of you are PhD students. And so... Good. Not that many. We've got 4% who claim that they are actually roboticists. So you need, you 4%, right? You need to challenge me and you need to shout, point things out that are rubbish, okay? And where you know better, because there will be places where you know ways better, okay? And the others also, please do shout out, right? If there is anything that you want to talk a bit more in detail. And we're going to do a little survey at the very end where you can try to direct a little bit what I'm doing tomorrow. Right. This is going to be quite quick and shallow entry into robotics. Um, I like the definition by Engelberger, right? I can't define a robot, but I know one when I see one. This is the best definition of robotics that I have found from all the many the people that have tried to ever define it. Um, because it, it turns out it's actually quite difficult to define what a robot is. I'm normally going with the definition. Oh, yeah, so let's. Oh, yeah, so I forgot this one is coming up now. So this is all your, your keywords that came up in here, so I'm going to try to pick a few out what you associate with the word robot. Programmed, task, I think task is an important part for me as well, right? So we want them to be somewhat useful. Uh, software, yes. Oh, there's Boston Dynamics in there. We've got a spot, but I'm not going to talk much about this, I think. Um, Semi-automated, what else have we got? Anything? Yeah. Robot dogs, no surprise. This is the fancy bit at the moment. Cars mentioned briefly in there. And I think the other key part that I think which is important for 
what I consider intelligent robotics is the learning aspect, right? So that we actually are not, we're not talking here about robots that do the same thing again and again. That is, for me, mostly automation. Here we're talking about robots that can actually sense the world. So percepts, they have the environment, they get something in there. They do some sort of reasoning with that, and then they act. And for me, the physical world is important. So you can argue with me what a Dell robot is. There's software robots, of course, software bots these days. Um, when I talk about robots, I mean physical entities that have a means to interact with the world. Interacting with the world could only be that they just localize them, that they just move about, right? But that's the definition for me, and that is, according to Brady, the intelligent connection of perception and action. That's simple robotics, and I would say with the environment. Yeah? Um, this is where the, the name comes from. Probably many of you know this, right? It was a play, which was called Rossum's Universal Robots. It was a stage play from 1921. So the term robotics is now a bit more than 100 years old. And anyone who speaks Czech or any related languages knows that this comes from hard work, labor. And it's the, it's the, the initials, the end of the first of these sort of N ever repeated stories that they become sentient and eventually they revolt against their creators. Because let's be honest, what do we want a robot to be? It's got to be very, very provocative, but in some ways we want it to be the slaves that we don't feel bad about. Many people at least see it that way, right? So there is a huge debate these days, and you may have seen some of these news, whether we should give some universal, maybe some human rights even to robots as they are becoming, they say, exhibit more and more sentient behavior, whether that is something we need to do. I will not start this discussion with you now that we defer to tonight, if you want to, still, if you're still up for that. Um, they are obviously now being used in many, many different applications, and we, I think everybody will agree with my definition that an autonomous car is also a robot, right? It has senses the world, it makes decisions, and it acts in the actual world. So, uh, therefore, these autonomous cars are part of that. We see robots being used in security, nursing, industrial production. Also, they become more and more adaptive and therefore more intelligent, not just doing the same thing all over again. And, of course, is that my sort of latest uh, passion about using robots in agriculture. As you see, I'm running through relatively quickly. What I'm going to show you now is one of the examples of a robot in agriculture. Uh, this is from a big project that we have just completed, where we had uh, these so-called Thorvald robots. We worked with a company called Saga Robotics quite closely, and they come in all shapes and sizes. These are robots, these are the ones that do logistics tasks, so they move along the field and um, help pickers to transport things, because these people spend a lot of time just moving around. We have used these for crop care, so they use UVC light to fight uh, a kind of uh, a mildew, a powdery mildew disease. We monitor them, checking uh, the ripeness of grapes through computer vision techniques. We feed that into time series models, so that's all sorts where your, where your new transformers come in and show the best performance to do yield forecasting over long, over weeks. You assess the current state of the field and you use forecasting to then identify how much will you have in three weeks' time. And also for harvesting, and that is a particular challenge to pick and identify this one. So this was a large-scale demonstration where we brought all these things together on one farm um, and played with also this is uh, a colleague of me who's basically worked on the safety of these systems, another kind of really closely related important aspect of that. Um, let's take this very quick example here as one of the things when I talked about Innovate, uh, Innovate, that's the funder, Innovate UK. Uh, Internet of Things devices. So we um, I just make reference to another conversation I had earlier on where we talked about the challenges of accurate GNSS. So we have this little uh, box up here, right? this sort of so-called smart trolley device. It's got a very cheap embedded GPS and a 4G module in it, um, and it's attached, costs around whatever, 16 pounds or so, and attached on these trolleys, and that allows us to track these trolleys to find out where people actually are, and so they can summon a robot. All we do to support Picker, because harvesting itself is something that is very challenging still, here we are just allowing people 
to call a robot over and to know where it needs to go. They push a button and the thing will come, they unload stuff and they can carry on doing the task that they are really good at, which is picking, and they don't have to trundle along hundreds of meters of these tunnel, these growing environments, uh, and waste their time and carry heavy boxes. Right? So that's the idea here. Um, and what we've done, uh, just kind of one work that I can probably uh, make reference to later as well, uh, put this in the, in the pile of papers, is you need to actually work with these very cheap GPS devices, and you do use a technology that we are very familiar with in robotics, namely Bayesian localization, right? Sensor fusion. And what all, you, or probably you know, some of you will know this sort of stuff, a particle filter, Monte Carlo localization, which is just the idea that you try to represent the hypothesis of where something is as a probability distribution that is approximated with a number of samples, effectively these so-called particles, and then you do important sampling again and again. You make this iteratively, and you can merge all sorts of different observations into this. And one observation can be these GPS systems here, and what we've done is just that we constrain this, these particles by the topology of the field. Topology will become important again later on, because topology is basically just the layout. And the layout in these fields is pretty boring. You've got a long line, a sort of hedgerow, right, where you can walk along, and then you go into tunnels, and these tunnels are 300 meters long. And you can't go anywhere else. You cannot move to the side in them because you've got the tables and the crops right next to you. So just putting that prior information in allows us then to you know, constrain these particles enough so that we get enough precision out to know that our robot needs to go down this particular row. Um, and that's the system that's now you know, close to being commercially used. Um, the general enabler for all of this is that we have robots that can move reliably and can operate in these quite challenging environments. These are very narrow spaces, so making robots work and navigate in very tight spaces is a particular challenge because they like to avoid obstacles. And this is in environments like these Foley tunnels or these strawberry environments particularly hard because you have got all sorts of things that interfere with your senses. Like strawberries have this very annoying tendency of developing very long runners that dangle down. And then they get into your sensor reading and all of a sudden the robot thinks something is amiss and there's something in the way. So we need to actually have an understanding of what we're looking at. It's not enough these days anymore to understand there is something in the way, but we need to understand what it is. If it is a stupid runner, we can happily ignore it. It will just move out of the way as we all, right? We all humans do this all the time, quite intuitively, but that means that we must also move to a better perception in these robotics domains. Um, other big challenge, which I'm already pointing out here to you, um, is the visually, visual aliasing. Anyone knows what that is? Perceptual aliasing? Yeah? Say, what is it? So when uh, you uh, uh, get similar places, for example, uh, exist at different locations in a map, and you, know, you wouldn't know where you are, uh, if you could be in front of one or the other. Yeah. Ex very good. Anyone been in England? Anyone seen red brick houses that people live in? They all look the same, right? Visual aliasing is you are at different places, but the place looks the same. Agriculture is worse than England, right? In that sense that everything always looks the same. So the classical way that we do of a sort of place recognition when we try to do maps is really, really difficult to do. And we are dealing here with different uh, with robots going through these very constrained environments, many of them, so we constantly have deadlocks. One robot is in one row, that means another one can't get past, it's too narrow. So big challenges of doing actual large-scale fleet coordination, because we're talking here of area of like 30 hectares of these tunnels, etc. So that's sort of interesting challenges that we're dealing with without going into too much detail in this. Now I'm going to go back into history a little bit, as one of the old examples, and I think most people will have known Shaky, right? A good old uh, first mobile robot that could be programmed for various tasks. Um, this was uh, done at Stanford AI Center, and they solved many of the problems that we still have today. And in many shocking ways, 
the problems have not really changed. And also, the ways to approach the problems have not really changed from 1966. They had a quite really, really well advanced individual components. So one was to plan a path to get from A to B. One was a system that tried to keep track of where this robot is at the moment. It, admittedly, it was in a really simple environment, and even at that days, they were very good at marketing. So the video is all very carefully edited, and I know it's been sped up in some places by 10 times. So the robot was creeping along like this, and then stopped, and did, and did, and did, right? Stuttering along. But the principle right, was very much the robot. same. So they had sensors at the top. I need to do this here, right? That's the Our thing. So it had, had sensors up here, so we have uh, different kinds of cameras. Wheels that act, and this was a little pushing device, so it could actually push obstacles around, so that was a sort of manipulation. And what came out of that, people that know AI and know AI planning, was the first sort of planning system also. Oops, hang on. Am I in the right spot here? Yes, I'll come back to it in a second. Um, well, the first planning system that was called STRIPS, right? And uh, I'll come back to that in a second, because what we started developing in robotics, more general, is that we have these sort of main, two main different architectural paradigms. One is what we call deliberative architectures. That means these are robots that actually have a goal, and they deliberate, they think of how to achieve that goal. In other words, they plan, and they plan this in an abstract way of the world, like, like as we do, we, have, we only incorporate the important bits for us to reason about the world, and we call that deliberative architectures. And the opposite of that is reactive architectures, where you just directly link sensor input to output. And then you bring them together, and that's probably what we use most of these times in hybrid architectures. So this is going to be really, really rushed through, because I don't want to waste too much time on that. Um, but Deliberative architectures are mostly linked to this concept of symbolic AI, or good old-fashioned AI, if you want. They emphasize this sort of top-down planning process, so we have a certain goal, and then we try to divide it into different actions, different sub-goals, whatever you want to do. And, you know, you, you probably have done this in your AI courses, and if this is your area of expertise, uh, apologies for my shallowness in this particular area, but what we do is we sense the world, try to feed our internal model. And the sensing can be all sorts of things, right? We've, in the past, in the system that I've built, this was everything from pre-trained object recognizers, from some information that we got from humans, some, some sort of speech information that we try to then represent in a symbolic way, um, all the way to sort of mapping algorithms that automatically build these sort of uh, topological maps that we have seen a little bit of. And... In this sort of representation, then, which we believe captures everything that is important for our problem, we make a plan to change the world from its initial state to its goal state, to the state we want to achieve. And we do this in proper formal ways. Yeah? So here's a way that we get, if you think of it, that there's often this idea of this is a horizontal decomposition of tasks. We sense, plan, act, and then we go back. The problem in robotics, probably already evident to everybody in here, is what if there was something going wrong? What if my sensing actually gave me the wrong interpretation, saying, no, this is a pencil? I'm not exaggerating, that was the vision problems that we had at the time, that these, these results came out. Um, but more important, you know, it just hallucinates and sees things that aren't there. Um, and then, what happens if my action, I want to go from A to B, I assume I went from A to B, but I never succeeded in going from A to B. My actions failed. So there's a lot of uncertainty that we have to deal with. That one we can skip. So as I said, the way it was done, uh, assuming we can abstract all the sensing away and we can discretize our action spaces, then we have a very simple uh, first planning problem that was called uh, the strips planner. And it's planned to accomplish the goal, and we have a symbolic representation of all the relevant information. Everything that we want to take into account has to somehow be represented in these symbolic states. And we've got this initial state that comes from our perception, and then we have some goals that we want to achieve. So, um, this is something that we can, 
let's say we don't have the time to do it now, but there's a little bit of homework that I'm going to give you. And I'm going to show you a quick run through myself. Because we have a simple strips planning system here um, that everybody is invited to play with. It runs on our, our server, and we've been using it for like, simple planning problems for quite a long while now. There's others in, on the web that you can also use, and Fast Downward is one of many, many, many different planning uh, planners, AI planners, that work all on the so-called um, planning domain description language, pdiddle, um, which is a formal language inspired by Lisp, how you can formulate AI problems. So this is pretty much a classical domain, as we describe it. This describes the overall domain of things we can achieve. It defines the predicates that represent the world, so how we're trying to symbolize the world. And it describes the actions. And an action has a precondition. That means we can only use this action ever when we have this precondition, and it has an effect. So after we've done this, this will be how the world changes. So now all we need is to define a problem. And I have some predefined one. Again, this is pretty much a shaky problem. We have two rooms. We define the objects. We have two rooms here, room A and room B. We've got four balls. We've got two grippers. And you see already, this is the, is, is, there's a lot of brains uh, going into how you define this problem. This is a single robot problem here, right? We don't model the robot itself. We just model two grippers. We can't easily extend this. And here we define the um, initial state. So we know the robot is in room A, its left gripper is free, its right gripper is free, and there is a ball at room A, and this ball is at room A, and so on. Okay? So this is complete, and it, you know, we can click and invoke this planner, and it will hopefully come up with a solution, and here is the plan. And this plan, because it's an optimal planner, is to involves 11 steps, picking this ball up with the left hand, picking this ball up with the right hand, then moving to the other room, and da 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 right? You sequence the actions. This is the simplest planning problem. I know some of you will know much more, or like will look at much more interesting ones, but for those who haven't done any AI planning, I really invite playing around with this. And we have come a long way, let's say, from these initial sort of planning problems these days. But the main problem is still, in planning, remains the same. We have a situation that we're in. We have a goal state that we want to achieve. And in between, to get from this to this, is a search among all the actions that you could possibly take. That is MP hard. We can't do that, right? All the actions, that if there is many of them, that is intractable. So that's why then planners employ heuristics and um, it allow them to potentially find the solution quicker. But we have had, and Johan will know this in this project that we had at the time, how often I've stood there, the robot, I said, like, here's a problem, solve this problem, find this particular thing, and the robot would walk around, and it would work perfectly. And the next thing, I moved this only ever so slightly. The problem definition was ever so slightly different, and it would be stuck there for 10 seconds, uh, 10 minutes and think and wouldn't find a plan, because unfortunately the heuristic wasn't tailored for that. And this is one of the amazing things we still, humans can still do, is how we actually apply heuristical reasoning to come up with some quick solutions, right? If you now, tonight, go back from here to your Airbnb, just while you walk, think about the choices you make very carefully. Every junction you approach, you have the option to go left, right, or straight. And you take some decision. Why? Why have you taken that decision? You apply basically, well, you know, maybe it is the route that you already know, but even if it isn't, you have a clear heuristic of how you approach these problems. And that's um, a general big challenge for uh, AI planning overall. Okay, so we have had this example. Um, this was one of the simple examples of uh, PDDL. Uh, planning, we have this, uh, this world definition, and then we have uh, a number of actions that we can take. And actually, here's the goal. I want all my rooms to be in room, uh, all my balls to be in room B. 
and then we can plan this. And of course, you know, there's different ways to achieve this, and we've not tackled anything here that it may be easier to, um, to pick up one ball or the other. We have not taken into account how long it is from one uh, room to the other. It may be easier to actually, to also, well, not easier, but it will be important to also consider uh, if you've got more than two rooms, how, which route to then take. So there isn't any route planning in here. We just assume we can go from one room to the other without any extra costs. Everything costs the same. Also strange, right? Picking up the costs is unit one. Uh, picking up a ball is unit one. Dropping one is unit one. Moving is unit one. So you see why this is a very, very simple way of, of looking at it. And there's a little bit of homework that uh, you can access from the uh, system there is uh, from from my website um, is to play around with this and solve some other problems. So if you want to have a bit of a look into this sort of simple symbolic planning and play around with it, this is your homework, right? Get this ball from here to here, this one, here, so define that, and also see that you cannot go from every room into every other room. How would you have to extend the domain, and how would you describe that? problem. I know it's, it's a long day, so I'm not going to insist that everybody has it ready tomorrow, right? But this is one of the options. You can also turn it into a multi-robot problem. So we can actually use the same sort of general planning framework, just changing the definition of the problem, saying, actually, let's plan if we do this with two robots. Then we can start thinking about putting other constraints in. There can only ever be one robot in a room, or only one can go through the door. And that's how we often need to kind of frame these problems, right? Cool. Okay, so, whoops, why is this? Yeah, there we go. So, um, these deliberative architectures have quite some limitations, as hopefully I've already pointed out. One is the closed world problem, so all information is present. That's the assumption we have, right? If we cannot, we can only reason about the things that we have in our model of the world. So anything that is unexpected, really, we can't cope very well with. Um, so it's the problem. What is relevant, what is irrelevant at the moment? We just make a complete model, and we may not all use it. Um, and as I already hinted, some of these search problems can be very, very untractable. And we haven't had a great chance yet to deal with uncertainty. So here's, a, here's one thing that I'm going to probably quickly run through this. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about reactive architectures. Because of all these problems people came up with, like, oh, we, do we need all this reasoning? Do we need to form models? Can't we just make simple robots? And you know Rodney Brooks, the one who basically made these Roomba robots uh, um, very successfully based on this paradigm, said, oh, we don't need. The, the world is our model. So let's just take the sensing as we have it right now and directly come up to some action we do. And that's quite cool, right? Because that allows us to... It's good for obstacle avoidance, and if you randomly make a little robot that just randomly moves around, whenever it sees something in front of it, it turns and then carries on and carries on and carries on, then actually eventually you will cover everything, right? Then you solve a sort of coverage problem just by stochasticity. Not very smart, but it kind of works. So that's what underpinned the first iterations of these sort of devices, right? Roombas and lawnmowers and others. So obviously, very much limited to this one specific hardwire task, very much limited by the sensor range. Can't reason about anything that is in the sensor range. So planning to get from here to your hotel is pretty much impossible with that approach. Okay, so what people do these days, and even, even shaky hard days, is we bring this together, right? We take the best of both worlds. We plan to invoke certain actions at some time, but these actions themselves already do sensor act or coupling. So that is the typical thing when you do robot moving from A to B. It may <clears throat> we, we plan to go from here to here, we plan from to go from now and go out, out of this room, but how we get from this to this is due to some kind of local motion planner that is very reactive and just takes the local environment that it can sense into account. Uh, that's the typical simple thing. Same for uh, manipulation. Right? We plan to pick up this object, but how we approach it, we do this by visual surveying rather than assuming that the position is 100% correct. We may do clever things of putting a camera in here that just adjusts this. And you find this in a number of uh, robotic solutions these days. 
So we're trying to bring this together. And one of the kind of typical ways of doing this is that we have sort of a high-level deliberator planner that generates a sequences of actions. We execute and monitor the execution, and we invoke some local controllers that, ex that actually do these sort of things, for instance, from going from one place to the other, and then they feedback if something has not worked out. We may then have to first try again. We have some recovery behaviors and may eventually even have a replanning request when we've updated the world saying stuff didn't work out. And that's what underpinned Dora. Dora is a little robot that we had at the University of Birmingham back in the days. And this is robot in my house in Birmingham uh, looking for a box of cornflakes. So what does this robot do? It's, so the idea is, and go back to this idea of having a robot that you buy just off Amazon, right? and you want it to be useful. So you want this robot to be able to make you a cup of tea. Let's decompose this problem a little bit. It's just switched on. You bought it off Amazon. You turn it on. Um, and you turn it on in this room. And you tell it, well, let's drop the tea, uh, the, the tea example. Let's say I want some cornflakes. Bring me some cornflakes, because that's what I've run in this video. It has some cool behaviors, right? It can map the environment. We'll come back to mapping in a little bit. And uh, it has some frontiers-based exploration. That is basically has an awareness of where the map ends. And it can go there. And it has viewpoint planning, which you also may have heard, right? Which basically is a coverage algorithm. So you basically I need to look everywhere. You know your field of view. So you can plan what's the most efficient way of covering this particular area so that I can make sure that I've seen everything reference to the art gallery problem, effectively, right? So how can I make sure that I, I find everything? Um, and this is what happened here, right? It had nothing, it had no map, it had nothing. I turned it on and told it, get me, find me some cornflakes. It had some innate behaviors. It can understand my speech when I told it to get me some cornflakes. And it knew exactly how to build maps. And it had also something that we then refer to as common sense. But I'll come back to this, because this was extremely stupid. So let's have a robot that is actually making sense of the real world, the, the wild, as we want to call it. Because we know that objects tend to be in certain places. That's common sense. If, I were, if you were to come to my house, even if you've never been, I'm sure you wouldn't just spend 15 minutes of searching everywhere whether I have my cornflakes in that room, just because you happen to be in that room. You would try to actually understand what room this is and what new, use your knowledge of what houses typically look like. And we know that this is, here's a map of a building, and that map has different objects associated with it. So we have a sort of augmented, annotated, semantic map, if you want. Right? We know what these are different rooms, different room types, so semantics. And with so semantics, we may have different objects. So cereals are found in kitchens, or are they found in dining rooms, or are they found in living rooms? Where are they actually found? Where do we get this common sense knowledge from? Well, back in 2011, I believe it was, um, we didn't have LLMs yet, right? So today I would probably say, ask, ask ChatGPT, uh, where do you usually find cornflakes? <laughs> and it would probably tell me. But it wouldn't be able to tell me exactly what this room is. Back in the days, we still used the internet as the sort of idea that it already encapsulates the, uh, uh, the common sense of, the, of humanity relatively well. And we do very rudimentary Bayesian reasoning of doing Conjunctive terms, kitchen, cornflakes, find how many hits you get, divided by kitchen. Ah, the probability of, the, you know, the conjunct probability of kitchen and cornflakes, divided by the uh, probability of kitchen, gives you the conditional probability of having cornflakes in kitchens. <clears throat> Very rudimentary, as I said, right? But it, gave you a, it gives you something to reason about. And if you do that, actually you come up um, that you can put this into a planning framework. So here's a sort of graphical uh, representation of our probabilistic representation. So it's similar to what the strips we've seen before, only that we don't have just predicates that are true or false, but we can quantify their probability. Makes the search problem harder, but the principle is still the very same. As I said, these days you would probably do something similar by embedding LLMs, and this is exactly one of the key robotic search tasks these days, is this language-driven mapping, language-driven driven search, where you, these days people are trying to really go out and just tell, in an unknown environment search this object, and this is very well alive and kicking as a problem. Um, 
but we did it very early, and I would love to go back to that a bit more. So, but the general idea, we need to encapsulate this common sense. And, but in this case, actually, once we enable that, made this robot go away, because it also had a sort of room classifier, it classified the semantics of this room, noticed that this looks very much more like a living room thing, and so decided it would be better off to explore further. So it took the, in the planning stage, took the action, explore another frontier. And when a new frontier is explored, we're going to carry on. And you see then, it kind of drives it into this next room, and you see these pie charts changing in a second. Oh, this one looks more kitchen-likey. Right? It becomes red. Uh, and that means, again, when, this, when these probabilities change, we replan, and now it can actually decide that oh, this is higher chance of finding the objects, so it eventually found it. It then looked everywhere and found it. You do this a couple, a number of times, we call this a knowledgeable system and the, non, and the uninformed system, and you see that uh, to find the complex boxes after, uh, I forgot, it was like 25 iterations or so uh, in each of these cases. It's some, it takes quite a long time when it doesn't know, and it's significantly quicker when it is knowledgeable. Cool, so common sense knowledge plays off. What happened up here? We've got one outlier in the knowledgeable case. That's an interesting one, because what happened in this case is that the robot went into the kitchen, searched, and as we all know, computer vision fails, so it looked straight at the object but didn't see it. So, because it's all probabilistic, the probability of the thing being in the kitchen now was smaller, so it decided to actually go back to the other room. Did an exhaustive search of my entire living room, couldn't find it because it wasn't there. But there was still probability left, right? So that's the, the, the nice thing about probabilistic reasoning in this case. We didn't commit to the fact that it isn't, doesn't exist because we didn't see it. We kept a probability here that it is still potentially in the kitchen. So it went back, searched again, and found it this time. Exactly the same behavior that I do with my keys, right? And I have my keys somewhere. I, uh, I look where they normally are. I don't see them. Don't ask me why. I search the rest of the house, eventually come back to the place where they usually are, and then miraculously they are there. That happens all the time. So robot went back, forth, and eventually found it. Okay, cool. Um, just if anyone is interested, the planning domain with all the additions uh, that we have had we had in that system. Um, is still available, so this is uh, from the IROS 11 paper, where we did this autonomous visual search, and you see a number of things that are different to the original uh, strips planning that I've shown you earlier, is mainly that this is partial observability, and then we've got dynamic objects, and we've got action costs in there, and so we have a, a domain that is richer, let's say, and that copes with these probabilities, um, and it is also significantly longer, so that was quite a bit of work to make this all happen. Cool. So, where are we? I'll take a quick break. So far, questions on this sort of system. Yes? I have a question. Uh, during the planning phase, uh, there are considered a physical resolution of the robot, I mean the velocity that it can take, or they are considered so what we do in the sort of um, planning phase, when we do root planning, so what in, in this particular domain it was all that the, the, the discretization of the space was so that each uh, node was exactly the same distance than every other node. So we had all length of these sort of nodes, uh, ed the edges between the nodes were the same. So somebody assigned a fixed cost to that, may basically, in the planning stage of how long it takes. What we do these days, where we can show a little bit more about topological maps there, um, I can even show you later on where we so then learn and adapt the costs, because you get it from experience, right? Where you can model that this now has taken that long, and you update your model to next time actually potentially take another route, because you've learned this was a bad route. Um, but yet, you can actually change those costs around. So, in, in, But in this case, it was fixed. Okay, great. Somebody five minutes in. <laughs> Other questions? So we're kind of halfway through, so it's hard to say. No? Otherwise, I'll carry on, and we hopefully have a bit of a chance to
play around a bit with stuff later and can take some more questions. So, actually, and I've probably hinted at that, there was a lot of stuff that was going on, even in that system, and in all of these systems. I mentioned in that system, it built a map. Right? It started off building a map using some sensor. I haven't told you which sensor I was using. but I'm going to talk to that a bit. Uh, I told you that it had frontiers, right? that it actually knew where the end of its map was. So mapping is clearly uh, a key part for these types of robots. Um, we have also talked that it could see objects right, with its camera. So all these things had to somehow come together. And um, what I'm going to try to do now a little bit is give you a, a bit of a more run-through on the sort of mapping side of these systems, because they allow us also to capture, lay the ground for some more of the interesting bits we can talk about, because I'm going to talk much more about maps, not just only today, but also tomorrow. So, mapping in robotics. Uh, what actually is a map? So, collection of elements or features of uh, at some scale of interest, Again, it's a level of abstraction. We will always abstract, right? Maps is something that we reason again, and the representation of spatial and semantic relationships among them. So spatial is the key word, right? I think you all agree that the maps are about the representation of space. Um, in the sort of long-term autonomy aspect that I'm particularly keen in, where we have robots that are actually exposed to the world over long periods of time, we often talk about spatial temporal maps as well, because as it turns out, the world is changing and we may want to represent that change. So the term spatial temporal maps will come back being quite important. We need maps for huge varieties of tasks. They may, not, they may sometimes be the end in itself. Sometimes somebody is actually just interested in a map. That's the output of any robot being deployed and autonomously gathering a map. But robots need these maps themselves. They need to localize in them, indoors particularly, where we don't have GNSS. Um, we need them as the representation to plan in. So planning is, again, similar to what we've done before. We discuss the, the, um, our, our world in some way and do some planning in it. Uh, we need it for manipulation. You know, if you want, this is also, uh, can also represent a map, and I want to actually grasp this bottle, so I need to have a representation of my obstacles in there, again, that's trajectory planning. doesn't matter whether you've got mobile robots or ones with arms. It's always the same problem that you have. You use a sort of representation that you then can do some planning in. And even for aspects like human-robot interaction, they uh, are important. For instance, you have often maps of population density, let's call it, in an environment, where you know this is where a lot of people are and you may want to avoid them when you plan your path for the robot, as one example. Um, and... So, you know, getting maps, start uh, building good maps is quite a demanding task, potentially, if you do it manually. So that's why, of course, we've got a lot of automated mapping these days. Keeping them up to date is particularly challenging as well, because, as I said, we've got changing environments very often. Um, just the sort of types of maps. So we have got metric maps, record, location of objects, features, absolute, in an absolute coordinate system. That's the typical ones you, you know when you've got these sort of nice grid-based maps, for instance, um, and that are true to the distances. So the distance between features can be accurately measured. We've got topological maps. They are a very nice abstract level uh, of just having notes, no, notes, notes like these, and edges between them. They basically uh, are what you also know from, I don't know, railway maps, tube maps in London, etc. Right? They don't exactly represent the positions, but they show you which place is connected to which place. And in this map that you've just seen, exactly we have both in there. So we have a metric map of the walls, and we know where the doors are, etc. And we have got a topological map that's automatically built as the mapping process. It's a graph. Okay. Semantics maps, they uh, include then semantic information. Oh, look, we've got this in here as well, because the little pie charts represent the semantic information of what type of room this is, looks like. And so, typically, this is, this is a semantic topometric map that we have built, if you want to put everything together. Right? But in usually terms, we, we think about these metric maps to do sort of local path planning and uh, put uh, 
relation, put, put information together where, in, where distances are important um, spe be between specific features, and these topological maps are nice because they're quite nice abstracted and you can do planning in them on a large scale. I remind you of the farm environment, which was like 30 hectares, and uh, I think total length was 60 kilometers of tunnels, potentially ways you could go. So, a lot. Cool. So, what sensors do roboticists usually use? That's the first one. Um, people, have, people know odometry. People that do autonomous driving definitely know odometry. Everybody else, it's just the sort of uh, so-called deduced reckoning systems, which basically means you're integrating your position from your own perceived movement. I'll give always this uh, stupid example of I close my eyes, I try to shut every sensor off that I possibly have, and I do some uh, open loop control and still try to figure out where I am. So if I'm trying to go in the square, you just... Whether I was back in my original spot, I don't know. Right? So that's um, what we get from odometry sensors. They just measure in terms of wheels, for instance, where how fast the wheel is spinning, and we can easily infer how much we may have traveled. We integrate the speeds that we have there, and that gives us a good estimate of the position. Key thing for us to actually find out where we are, um, and unfortunately, as you've already probably seen, it's, it's integration, so integration is rubbish when you have some sort of noisy signal, because you're also integrating the error. So this was a, a robot that was going around this floor plan five times, and what it thought it had done is shown on the right-hand side. That's by integrating the velocity, and as this seems to be a systematic error, so probably one wheel was ever so slightly smaller or bigger than the other, which made it kind of think it was going on a slight curve all the time. So it's not enough to have odometry sensors, usually. There's lots of research to go into what is also called visual odometry, where you do this, uh, where you take, see the sort of um, changes from one frame to the other in the video system, etc. So there's many, many ways to improve on that. But what we normally try to do in mapping and in localization is to use other sensors that actually measure the environment. Visual odometry does that to some extent already, doesn't it? Um, so lots of sensors are time of flight sensors. The good old ones are sonars. So simple, you, you send out a signal, and you know the speed, you can measure the time how long it takes to come back, and uh, you get some idea of how far things are away. Oh, yeah. Quite noisy signals. I don't know if anyone is still, still using sonars. Not for any sort of bigger robots. These kind of small ones often use them still. And, but you can build a map with those, right? It's noisy signals, and you get some information from them. Uh, the, the ones that everybody knows these days, probably LiDAR sensors. You see them also on, I don't know, the autonomous driving group. Have, do you use LiDARs at all? Yes, excellent. So, brilliant, terribly, well, they come down in price, but they used to be terribly expensive. Um, a uh, similar principle, time of flight, you're sending out some signal, comes back and you measure the time it takes to come back. Uh, only thing is light is terribly fast, so you need very precise electronics, which makes this more expensive, but otherwise it's the same as a sonar. So, and then you've got a rotating mirror that gives you that in high precision. And then you can do this also not just in one single beam, you can do it in several beams, um, and then you get these sort of representation as you see at the bottom left. And I'm sure, again, I think the autonomous driving folks will know this sort of data inside out. Um, the slightly, what, what recently becomes more interesting, I think, is radar again. Radars have been in cars for a long period of time. Um, they have some nice proper, uh, properties that they can see through snow and fog and other things that are quite prevalent also in this country. Uh, and you can use them as to uh, map out the world. In, the nice thing with them is, of course, that they traverse through some of the objects, so you can see behind them. Do you use radars as well? Excellent. There we go. I'm not going to... You need to tell us then much more about this. Um, in the end, the problems, the only thing that is different, really, is with, uh, uh, with radars is that your sensor model has to be changed. Right. The, otherwise, the sort of mapping algorithms are often very similar, the general principle of them. 
Good. So, and of course, this was for me the big important change in robotics because before every sensor was bloody expensive and then eventually the Kinect came along and made everything cheaper. Another sort of sensor that is very typically nowadays used to see obstacles and feed data into mapping algorithms, all the sorts of RGBD sensors, um, which I'm sure everybody here is also using. There's other cool sensors, uh, touch for instance. So this is one from Bristol. This is uh, from a paper called Rat Slam. You probably can tell why it's called Rat Slam. So they implemented whiskers. And again, the whole thing about mapping is you basically try to localize features and then you're trying to localize in relation to those features. So they use this to then map out entire worlds uh, using this sense of touch. At the bottom is a sort of, is uh, from a lab that does olfactory robotics. So this is a sensor that can sense volatile organic compounds and measure their uh, directional distribution, right? We've got these both sides, so you can see whether there's more concentration on this side than on this side. So you can, very, very noisy and uh, but not very well localized sensor, but uh, you can use that as well. And this, for instance, uh, another follow-up on this is then being used to map out landfill sites to smell out where there's gas, etc., coming out potentially. Good. So, rather than trying to give you a full lecture on SLAM, I go back to my good friend Cyril, um, who you may have seen, and it, I just need this to advertise his fantastic lecture series. It's five minutes with Cyril. Anyone who wants to know anything more about specific things, about localization in robots, uh, visual odometry, SLAM, localization, etc., I really recommend this series. I'm going to run the one on SLAM for you to just kind of embed all these things I've said um, into the general concept of SLAM. Let's see if it works this time. What is SLAM? Crank the volume up. stands for simultaneous localization and mapping. And I hear it, but the volume needs to come up a little bit. It was louder before. The task of estimating a map of the environment and at the same time localizing your sensor or your robot in that map that you're currently building. Um, and it's something that mobile robots need whenever they move into unknown or partially unknown environments because they need to build a map of the environment and localize itself within that map. If a map is given, then things are much easier. You just need to localize yourself. And if a pose estimate is given, then mapping is also relatively easy. Um, but solving both problems together is much harder. And so is that clear, right? So if you have got, if you know exactly where you are and you sense something over there in the world, then it's very easy to build a map. Okay, fine. Um, knowing where you are in relation to an existing map is also fairly easy if you get all the features that you know exactly, you know, you can do simple triangulation. I know this guy, this guy, oh, all right, I know where I am. The challenge is in mapping itself when you don't know yet where you are and you don't have a map yet, it becomes this hen and egg problem, right? So you basically have, you need to model this uh, entire state space. The position where you are is, is, is the uncertain bit and the it's, uh, um, map itself. It's something that has been investigated in robotics since, let's say, the beginning of the uh, 1990s. Um, and we typically uh, find different approaches uh, in order to solve this land problem. Um, we have to distinguish here between the front end and the back end. So the front end is a part which takes the raw sensor data and turns them into an immediate representation, such as constraints in an optimization problem or probability distribution about the location of, let's say, a landmark um, derived from sensor data. So transferring sensor data into an intermediate representation. That's very task specific. So I'm going to also say this is where you see these days that uh, a lot of development on the front end side of any sort of mapping algorithms, basically the transfer of the perception of the, how you see the world, be it images, be it LIDAR readings, be it point clouds that come from this, um, into this in sort of intermediate representation, as he called it. That's where you see also a lot of deep learning being employed these days. Right? So a lot of the deep slam methods are basically focusing on the front end. And then the second part of the back end, which takes this intermediate representation and solves the underlying state estimation or optimization problem. So estimating parameters that describe me, for example, where objects are in the environment or where my platform is in the world. 
And um, in this back end, we typically find, let's say, three different categories of approaches. The first one are the extended Kalman filters. This is how it started, at least in robotics. Uh, the alternative is particle filters or least squares or so-called graph-based SLAM approaches. And those graph-based SLAM approaches are today the most popular ones. So if you build a new SLAM system, you would most likely start with a graph-based approach. In those graph-based approaches, we, as the name says, use a graph to represent the um, variables and the relations between those variables. And the different types of graphs which are out there, the two most popular ones today are either a post graph, which is a graph that contains only the poses and marginalizes out the map information, um, or factor graphs, which um, have factors sitting in between nodes, in between variables, and the information coming from the front end or from other sources, um, prior information can be stored in those factors. And they are both kind of similar, what you can do with it, and different optimization toolboxes used in different internal representations. Um, how to solve this least squares problem? This is typically done using optimization techniques, um, and there's a large variety of parameters or options that you can choose. There are also toolboxes out there that you can use. The three most popular ones for the backend are probably G2O, um, GTSAM, and Ceres, which are kind of three systems which help you to solve your optimization problem. And these are the most popular ones today. Um, they either use factor graphs or they use a form of slam graphs or post graphs as a special form of, uh, of these graphs. So in post graphs, for example, every node represents the pose of the sensor at a certain point of time. And the edges between those nodes, nodes represent the spatial relations that are extracted from that sensor data. And then the optimization system basically tries to find a new configuration of the nodes so that the overall error that is introduced through the edges actually gets minimized until I find the minimum error configuration, which is my least square solution. And again, this is um, a technique that is used whenever you need to build a map of the environment and localize yourself within that map. So something that mobile robots need to do, autonomous cars need to do, UAVs need to do. Um, so every system which moves through the environment, potentially if it does it on its own. There's also strong links between um, visual slam and bundle adjustment. Uh, so bundle adjustment has been there for much longer. So in the 1950s, uh, people from photogrammetry developed bundle adjustment. And you can see this as a special form of visual slam, which has a special form of constraint that is basically the reprojection error of pixel coordinates. Um, but there are very strong similarities between those approaches. Um, the SLAM formulation is typically somewhat more general, but basically came, let's say, 30 to 40 years after this has been developed in photogrammetry. So, as I say, there's fantastic more videos by Cyril if you haven't seen them. Highly recommended. So what we We've taught the vehicle to recognize and navigate through construction zones. <laughs> Our sensors spot the <laughs> orange signs and cones early to alert the car of the lane blockage well. ahead. And Excellent. we can change lanes safely. So, um, you know, we'll this is again making reference probably to those people in autonomous driving. Um, you may not necessarily always have a full map of the world, or you will definitely not have a full map of the world, right? So you basically uh, use those all sorts of combined sensors. You're using it some localization from uh, GNSS, for instance, in there, and then you build local maps, whatever local means in this environment. Again, this is quite similar than what we do in agriculture. We will never have a full metric map of an entire farm environment. It's actually not required. Why would we in that sense, right? We, when we have just the sort of ideas of going from one place to the other along one tunnel, it is perfectly fine to have that, for instance, as one uh, local map. And it actually, as we've heard before about perceptual aliasing, every tunnel probably looks the same anyway. So there is very little point of trying to model those differences. And, um, but building maps, even for temporarily planning, temporary planning, temp ugh, so, you know, for, for pl uh, planning in that particular situation, is something that's happening all the time in robotics. Good. So, um, and then, of course, we can build maps. And you've, you've seen this sort of, uh, the nice thing about these post graphs is the direct link with topological maps, because you get this post graph out of that, as we've just seen. And you've got the sort of metric representation of the features around you. That is then something like we see on the top right, for instance. Um, 
and we have got here different types of maps. This is from a this is from a 3D LiDAR, as is this one. This is from a 2D LiDAR, and this is like a superimposed thing that we, because we've done lots of mapping also of, uh, for instance, soil properties. So you send robots out and they just measure these sort of uh, properties and integrate them into overall map representations. Good. So the question now is, do we want to have a bit more time for questions or do we go into playing a little bit around. I think we're going to play a little bit around and I'm showing you the absolute basics of how we basically put all these systems together. Who knows Ross? Hands up. Okay, that's not many. You know that it exists. You know that it exists. Excellent. Good. So, what I'm going to show you, and uh, we made some efforts here to make it somewhat easy for you if you want to have a play around. I made a dockerized robot playground for you, which is inspired by our Bacchus project, which is an agricultural one, and it is a playground to play with some of the mapping algorithms and challenge them and see where the problems are when you want to localize in them. So I'm going to go and tell you a tiny, whoops, sorry, tiny little bit about ROS, really just so you understand a little bit of what I'm doing. So. What this is, this just needs to go very quickly. It's called the Robot Operating System. There's was one and two. One is being phased out. Uh, two is the new replacement because it's based on DDS, the Data Distribution Service, which is a kind of standardized middleware that's been proven in industry rather than a custom-made one. The key word is already there. Who knows middlewares? Hands up. Yeah, I had some software engineers here. Um, it's a middleware for distributed uh, processing, and I'm going to quickly run through this. It's all very boring for you. You've got all the slides later on. The key part is, as I have hopefully shown you, robotic systems are composed of many, many different components. These days, many of these components, when we do internal robot systems, are, you know, somebody made their little specific CUDA-enabled machine learning algorithm, and it needs to run here, and we need to usually deploy it as a container, and it needs to communicate with the rest of the system that runs in another container. Everything is very much distributed, and we want to have a huge degree of reusability. And actually, some of the code that even we've done in this Dora robot is these days still running as a component. And um, that's what we want to do. We basically want to quickly orchestrate these sort of systems, which is why we need middlewares. Um, so what we normally have, typically, we may have uh, you know, our environment. We have a robot that has some sort of drivers for its sensors and actuators, and it interacts with a whole graph of different processing components that talk to one another. And what ROS enabled is a much easier, loosely coupled system integration in robotics um, mainly through a couple of things I'm going to talk to you very, very quickly. Mainly through what they call plumbing, right? <laughs> which is the middleware, which is putting these different uh, talk, uh, components to, put, uh, to talk to one another. And at its core, it's a publish subscribe architecture, for those who know that. Um, a bunch of tools that allow easy introspection. Thousands of off-the-shelf implemented capabilities, because luckily, by now, there's a somewhat a consensus for research robotics that everybody is, mo most people are implementing their solutions in ROS as a component. So we have finally reached a level of reusability in robotics that we, I think, as a community can be quite proud of because most of the stuff that I'll show you is not from us. It's actually based on released packages of software that people have made available um, and a very good ecosystem. And because plumbing without middleware is horrific, right? It's point to point. You need to know if this one wants to talk to this one. You need to draw a line, somehow wire them up, and I agree this. The nice thing is ROS defines interfaces for almost, you know, for most common data types in, in, in robotics, uh, and you can, of course, define your own in your specific domain, um, specific language, um, and you have everything communication going through this middleware. And how it goes through this middleware, as I said, is mainly a publish subscribe architecture through so-called topics. Anyone who does our IO, um, IoT probably knows MQTT or Zero MQ or any of those. It's all pretty much the same, right? We have got named topics and we have got publishers that publish information and we have subscribers that consume them. 
So we can have several publishers going on to the same topic and we can have several subscribers subscribe to the same. And the plumbing that means basically for all the many different sensors we've seen so far, we have people that kindly provided some drivers or we do them on our own and they all publish the information out. And that's really important for robotics as well because everything is pretty much event driven. So uh, we have a semantic in, in robotics that we are basically have, sub have callbacks that we uh, on the subscriber side. So when new information becomes available, we react to that. That makes it easy to do reactive robotic systems, as we've seen early on, right? When we just have something, information comes in, we need to act on it. So we basically do some processing when this information comes in. Uh, but also for the um, sort of more hybrid architectures, it's, uh, we don't do polling on any sort of sensors. We always react to changes as they happen in the world. And then there's plenty of tools, which I'm going to show you a little bit in a second. And then we have got for all the different things we need to do, interpretation, uh, you know, mapping, we hardly, if, if you just want to build a robotic system and you're not a particular researcher into SLAM, you take one of the hundreds of SLAM packages basically that are available and try to integrate them. And obviously, as I said, this is the, uh, the sort of growth of ROS users and with ROS2, the industry has really caught on and really invested into this. So one of the biggest funders now is, is also Amazon, for instance, who um, moved to ROS as uh, their platform, etc. Huge amount of documentation around this and I will rather say, let's play. So let's see if my system is up and running still or whether it has died by now. So um, this is the reason why I asked for my own computer and made the technical folks here a bit nervous. What we've got here, I'm just going to, and this is something that you can play with yourself, is an actual robot system that is from our Bacchus project. And here's going to, I'm show you one of the tools called RQT, which allows us to have lots of different plugins so we can actually look at what is going on. So this is a list of this system. This runs entirely in simulation. Nice thing is, because it's a through a middleware, if I have the same robot, it is just the very same thing, only I don't start up the uh, simulator, I start up the real robot. Otherwise, the sort of types and names of the topics in a well-defined system are very much the same. And here we've got quite a few of those things that you may have uh, already seen in my discussions before. So we have got things like a scan. Uh, let me just, yeah. So here's a, this robot that we have got visible there, sitting in a little vineyard that we made up. We can say we want to actually subscribe to this topic and we get some information. All a bit slow, this is running on my computer at home. Um, and this is a predefined data type in ROS, sensor messages, laser scan. Uh, we can see that it comes in with about 40 hertz, so that's the actual sensor data we're getting. And the nice thing is because it's a standard interface, almost any laser-based SLAM system that is available in ROS can just be plugged in to be used using this sensor data. Okay. Um, and we can easily introspect it because Publish Subscribed allows to do that quite easily. Okay, we have, an, we have many other sensors in here. We have got uh, an IMU, so an inertial measurement unit, which can tell us how this thing is currently accelerating. Now, it's a good simulation, so it gives us some noise. So this is the raw reading from the sort of IMU you may also have in your phone, for instance, which, again, we can use to... Um, instead of pure odometry to, to get better at localizing where we are. We've got all the different topics that we can basically interact with, and one of the topics that is also out here is, is a map. So it is, I'm going to just disable those again, um, is that it is currently run, as this number of components are running on here. Um, and I'm going to show you how many, because I can show you the node graph. Uh, let's do it like this. Very neat. Let's make it a bit simpler. Still a bit big. 
So you can't really see each of the details in here. That's fine. But what when we zoom in, which we can if I do it the right way, we see that, for instance, if we go further down here, these are the nodes. So these are actually each process has a certain role to play and it publishes on certain topics and others are subscribed onto those topics. If we go further to the right here, we see that Gazebo, which is the simulator, publishes all this simulated sensor information out. So we've got front scan, back scan, odometry. We've got an odometry sensor, as you've seen early on. We've got a number of image topics. So we've got uh, these sort of images as well out there. We see then that this one goes into a laser scan merger. This is another component that is off the shelf. It publishes this on a different scan topic and then goes into our, in this case, one of the many SLAM modules that possibly exists. We decided to launch something called Hector SLAM. And out that, it puts, exactly as we've just seen, a map representation and a localization of where it believes it currently is. Right, and so we can now make this thing move around. So that's what we've just seen earlier on. We start afresh. We haven't done anything yet. I'm just going to, instead of going autonomously, I'm going to move it around Where's my keyboard. And we're going to start driving. So this SLAM system is fairly, fairly simple in that sense that it is just uh, based on I'm too drunk a driver. Um, that it is just using the 2D LiDAR scan here to integrate readings from there. And you can probably already tell, like the red ones here is where these LiDAR scanner hits some obstacles. And you've probably seen this in this vineyard. Uh, there isn't a great deal of features there. Right? That's one of the challenges in agriculture here. So there's lots of leaves and little trunks and stuff there, but not very much I would consider very good features to actually integrate into a map to then localize in. So that's an important thing to actually take away initially, that some environments have horrible features. But the idea here is that you're going to... Okay, now I even managed to go into an obstacle. Ain't I good? Ah. Bad driving. See, that's why you need autonomous driving. There we go. So, that builds a map. You can actually do the same. And um, I'm going to just show you quickly on... Here, this is the little task I gave you. So this was Hector Slam. Um, if you are interested and you just want to try this out, quite easy. If you have Docker already installed, it's super easy. Then the rest is just pull this image that we've prepared for you, run it, go into your browser, and basically try to do these activities that I've just indicated. And then you can play with different Slam systems. So Hector is a very simple one. We kind of build a map, and you see the problem with that. We have got uh, what we have in this simulation, what is interesting is that you can actually launch it in different growth stages. So there's a vineyard that is basically hasn't got any grapes, and then there's one with full-grown canopy and, and all grapes in there. And that will give you an indication of the problems of localization and mapping. Because now you have, may have a map, but the world has changed. And if you try that out, you will see that the localization within the changed world is particularly hard because these features are not very stable. We're going to come back to that tomorrow as well. So you can try it in a different uh, growth stage. Leo Slam is probably the, one of the best uh, 3D point cloud based Slam algorithms. And you see also when you run that one, which I can probably try as we have the time before we get any more questions. I'm going to quickly go and see if I can have that one up and running. I'll stop this one and do the other. So you get one of the basic... Uh, the other thing that uh, is, is part of ROS is this so-called orchestration language launch files, which just basically describes in an XML format our, all the different components of, that you want to fire up together, right? So that's your um, particular orchestration. I'm going to run this one as well. And... There we go. This one needs to be closed. So it's coming up again. And you can have a go 
it gives you some suggestion of what you can try tuning and see how this behavior changes. And our tab map is one of the most comprehensive SLAM toolboxes, I would say, because it integrates many, many different sensors uh, together. So you can actually also make dense uh, visual maps, etc. But the principle underpinning all of them is exactly the same. We've got this sort of front end and back end, the sort of back end being the graph optimization that optimizes uh, the graph and does loop closures and does the overall estimation of it with this sort of front end that is about local features that are then put in relation to one another. Let's see if this is up and running as well. So I wanted to kind of show you that briefly because this is what the world looks like in in 3D point clouds in this particular environment. So you see we ha have hit the ground here and we've got a lot of dots on the, on the plants as we move along. And if we build a map around this, if we move forward, I can probably even show you the... Uh, da, 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 da. Check out in there. Again, if I move forward, you will see that the the map is slowly being built up. No, come on, update. Probably made a mistake here. Ah, there we go. So we build more and more a 3D map to the same sort of systems. So I was well aware this is, uh, you know, all relatively superficial. We're going to talk more about the specific challenges of. Uh, they come with that, the kind of deploying robots into the wild um, tomorrow. So this was a quick whistle-stop tour of some of the big robotics parts that we're doing. I will put this one out, hang on, if I can, to ask you also a bit what you would quite like to hear more about. So you can put your own topics in, in relation to robotics, and if I have something on them, I'll talk about it. Otherwise, you can upvote things that are already there if you want to. But for now, I'm happy to first take some questions. And I know it's already been a long day, and you've got two more coming, don't you? Excellent. Thank you so far. Thank you. Thank you. But I'm, I'm around. <laughs> <laughs>